He went to the same university as me, um, University College London. And I think it was there where I turned away from politics, because I'd been interested, sort of, you know, all my life, particularly that 15, 16, 17, becoming politicised, hanging out in the sixth form and discussing communism and stuff. And uh, I do things like I used to sell anti-Nazi league badges and collect for the miners, because it was noisy, mainly. Um, and I even had that poster of Che Guevara on my wall at home to annoy my mum. It backfired. She thought it was Robert Lindsay. <laughs> And then, when I got to college, there were people better at that than me. Do you know what I mean? There were people that really meant it, and I was thinking, oh, God, was I like that? Um, I'll give you an example. I did philosophy, and after a few uh, weeks, you had to choose your options for the three years. And uh, compulsory subjects were logic and Greek philosophy, and you had to choose about six others. And I chose philosophy of science, philosophy of mind, um, morality. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there was a Marxism option. And I thought, I'd be great, I've always been interested in that, and I'll do it. And it was only a small department, about 25 people, and the tutors were all out, and you had to queue up and tick the thing you wanted. And I looked over at the queue for Marxism, and there were ten people in this queue. Three of them were wearing berets. <laughs> and I thought, God, I can't spend three years in a room with what I used to call at the time, cunts. <laughs> The first bloke I saw hooked up with was the opposite of that. He was uh, this big lumbering chemist called Pete Bront, yeah? And uh, I think it was about the first person I met, and he lived literally opposite me in the corridor at Ifor Evans Hall in Camden. And uh, 18, like the rest of us, but the mind of a 55-year-old fascist cab driver. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, just... Uh, uh, Society was going to the dogs and, oh, God, oh, the things I could do if I was in charge. That sort of thing. And I remember there was an advert at the time uh, for Strongbow. And at the end of the advert, two arrows were fired from a longbow. They went <laughs> and split the wood on a bar. That gave him the horn, that advert. Because <laughs> he used to imagine executing muggers and rapists like that. <laughs> and it would come on and he'd go quiet and he'd be watching it like that. And then, as I go, you go, ooh, that was in the head. <laughs> and he also used that to exercise demons. Like, you walk along the street, and it was like early 80s, so if he saw someone coming the other way, like a bloke with long hair and makeup or something, he'd just watch him and he'd go, oh. You'd <laughs> <laughs> be imagining killing him. But, uh, um, once we were walking home uh, from college, and um, he used to go in every day and buy his evening standard, right? And it was a little kiosk, I don't know if it's still there, but it was like just two piles of standards and a little old woman selling them. And he went in this particular day, bought his standard, 10p, looked at it, and the, uh, the cover story that day was a big photograph of a, an old age pensioner. She'd been mugged, and there was a picture of her and it's cuts and bruises, an awful story. And the old lady, uh, just making conversation, she probably said it to everyone who came in that day, she went to Pete, it's awful, isn't it? And he went, yeah, gentle. Yeah, she's 93. Scarred for life. <laughs> but you leave it, don't you? <laughs> Pete went, well, it's not scarred for life then, is it? She went, what? He went, you scar a baby for life, don't you? <laughs> she went, <laughs> but if she lives till she's 100, she's only been scarred for 7% of her life. <laughs> he did the maths for her. Like, this old woman's meant to go, yeah, you're right, fuck her. <laughs> but politics starts at an early age. You don't need to go to college to be exposed to politics. I think it starts from year naught, you know. It's in little sayings and songs, nursery rhymes, fables. They're charged with morality for, for kids. And I remember, I must have been as young as sort of six or seven, because it was infant school. And um, the first Monday of every month, the deputy headmaster used to do a fable at assembly, and it was his best day, OK? Now, he used to make it last about half an hour to 40 minutes, and he thought he was Peter Eustonoff. <laughs> and looking back, I think all the other teachers were going, look at that fucking wanker showing off to six-year-olds. <laughs> uh, he'd take his shoes off as well, yeah. And uh, I'll tell one that he told, a fable, OK? It was the fable of the two mice, the lazy mouse and the industrious mouse. All through the summer, there was lots of berries on the trees, the sun was shining, it was lovely and warm. 
The lazy mouse would be eating berries off the tree, taking a bite, throwing it away. There was loads, right? The industrious mouse, he'd have a berry, sure. <laughs> but he'd eat it all and he'd save one as well. Lazy mouse, ah, oh, forget that. Oh, just eating berries, running around. Okay. The industrious mouse, whatever, said, you know what, you should, you know, look forward to winter because those berries won't be... Oh, fuck off, you square, you know. <laughs> I've adapted it, right? <laughs> so, anyway, you get the picture. So, all through the summer, he's eating berries, he's running around, uh, sunbathing. <laughs> um, the industrious mouse, he's uh, busy, he's eat, uh, eating berries, collecting berries, freeze-drying them, um, <laughs> chopping wood um, um, with a little axe. <laughs> That he's, that he's fashioned <laughs> out of a twig <laughs> and a tiny little sliver of flint <laughs> and he's tied it on <laughs> with a horse hair <laughs> and that, thus making it easier for him to stockpile wood <laughs> for a much colder season. He hasn't got a fire at the moment, he's just... he's too hot, if anything. Just lying there like, oh. But come winter, burn the wood, make a fire. <sighs> um, so, last nice summer. So, to cut a long story, I'm making it last longer than he did, for fuck's sake. Right. <laughs> so, autumn comes, same pattern. Lazy mouse, he's just fucking about eating the last of the berries, right? The industrious mouse, collecting the last of the berries. And he's got too much wood, if you want, in my opinion. But he's, <laughs> he's, he's not going to run out. The stuff at the back's probably damp. Circulate it. <laughs> Doesn't know what he's doing, but he's doing his best. And the lazy mouse, he's just having a laugh. He's loving autumn. He's just kicking through the leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Underneath the leaves. You, you can't see him, because he's too short, but you can see the leaves sort of move like that. You sort of go... Huh. Huh. I can't... See with it's just lazy mouse. <laughs> you can't, but that's what's happening. If, don't think it's a ghost or something, or it's just... If you could go in there, like, with a really high-tech... Sort of, you know, like, in Discovery Channel, they go... <laughs> you'd probably see the lazy mouse going... <laughs> and, uh, winter comes. The ground is cold and hard. There's no berries on the trees anymore. It's freezing, OK? The lazy mouse is out there, he's scurrying around, he can't, can't find anything. The industrious mouse is in, in his cottage... <laughs> ..that he's built... <laughs> ..out of just odds and ends. <laughs> Roaring twig fire. Pipe! <laughs> Rocking chair. Or a pebble, just a pebble. <laughs> sort of modern. And... Don't they hibernate? <laughs> this is bollocks, isn't it? <laughs> These mice didn't, anyway. So he's there, and there's a knock at the door. And he thinks, who's that? So he goes over to the little door. <laughs> Tiny knob, obviously. Uh, <laughs> what do you want? It's obvious what he wants, isn't it? Um, and he goes, oh, well, uh, it's cold, and I'm... Hungry, and they well, definitely smokes now. Right? <laughs> That's not my porn mag. Right? He goes, <laughs> Well, I did warn you, didn't I? Yeah. Never mind. Come on in and share with me. Where's the moral there? <laughs> what is the moral of that tale? Fuck around, do what you want, then scrounge off a do gooder. <laughs> it's a terrible lesson for kids. Most of the kids in my class kept that up. <laughs> he also told the one about the uh, boy who cried wolf. A boy looking after his sheep. Gets a bit bored. It is boring. <laughs> Just making sure you've got... All... Probably tiring as well, cos if you're counting them, you're probably getting a bit drowsy, aren't you? <laughs> anyway, so... Gets a bit bored. <sighs> nothing to do here in... the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so... A long time ago. And he goes, um, uh, it was just a Monday, that's the worst, isn't it? And he's just bored. And he goes, I know what, I'll have a laugh. And he goes, uh, 
wolf, 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 wolf. And the villagers come up and go, where's the wolf? They go, no, there's no wolf. He goes, oh, you fool. <laughs> so the next day, he thinks, well, that worked a tree. I'll do that again. He goes, wolf, wolf, wolf. Where's the wolf this time? Still no wolf. Oh, you fool. Oh. <laughs> Third day, there really is a wolf. And he goes, wolf, 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 wolf. But the villagers don't come because they don't believe him. And we were told the moral of that is never tell a lie. No, it isn't. <laughs> the moral of that is never tell the same lie twice. <laughs> Terrible lesson for kids. <laughs>